Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, today I have uh, Kevin. He's a former maths teacher, um, becoming full stack developer at spinup.io, and um, you are a business owner and also an instructor at Egghead. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think most of those things are true. <laughs> I think all of those things are true. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Hi. So, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for um, wanting to be on the podcast. Can you start with just uh, your journey? So how did you start? How was that going from teaching math to be wanting mm. to be in the developer world? How was that yep. transition or how was that progress? Yeah, so um, I um, I taught math for uh, like quite a long time, maybe like 12 or 13 years. Um, I taught maths to 11 to 18 year olds. Um, which was great. I love maths and um, I enjoyed working with young people and helping them to love maths, which was sometimes successful, um, but <laughs> it was good. Um, and all the way through that, I was coding and doing bits and pieces. Um, um, uh, the type of, you know, I'm, maths and computers tend to be grouped together quite often. Um, and so, you know, I was coding from 11 with sort of my spectrum and, and then on to using different, um, my Amiga and, and PC later on. So coding's always kind of been something I've done um, and often just play stuff. Um, I am, um, teaching is quite exhausting. Um, <laughs> like you like, like um, being a flight attendant, you're on your feet the whole time and you're engaging with people the whole time. So it's not like where you can hide behind a screen or or you can um if you've had a if you've got a bit of a sore head that you can um like like ha like have a quiet day at work there's kind of no such thing as a quiet day at work when it comes to both um flight attending and um and teaching there's there's always those people to deal with and so um i would teach and i would do bits and, and when it got to holidays i would do sort of i'd learn a new programming language or I would um, build a, an app for something I'd use in school or I'd, I'd play around like that. I would um, say I would say that um, dealing with teenagers it probably takes harder work than being a flight attendant. So props for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I've been on planes with um, with drunk, unruly um, of passengers that I wouldn't like to have to have managed. So um, I equally, I'm <laughs> a lot of respect for what you, what you guys do. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, um, and teaching is a, is a great thing. I love teaching. I still teach through Egghead and, um, and online with my blog and newsletter and various things like that. But um, teaching in classrooms is, um, so the, there's a lot of um, stuff around teaching in classrooms. If I could sort of imagine just being in a classroom with kids and being in charge with what I'm teaching and how I'm teaching and how I'm assessing that and, and all of the pieces there, then that would be great. But around that, there's a lot of stuff which is less than fun. There's it's a all lot of the admin. planning, hmm? the observations, the paperwork and all this. Yeah. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I know a little bit of that because my wife, she's a teacher, but she's a year one teacher. So mm -hmm. I still see all the things that she has to do. And I'm like, they're just babies. Mm -hmm. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so there's that realism of, you know, the kids, your, you know, your wife knows the kids in front of her. She knows those kids and, and, and has a good idea of what's going to help them. But we kind of build on averages. We build on like at the end of year one, every year one kid should be able to do this or you failed. Yeah. When reality, like like my kid, my um youngest is in year two now, and um, no year one now, and um he he refuses to read. He can mm -hmm. read, but he refuses to. Whereas my elder is two years older, and you know was reading fluently before he started school. That's you know it's that kind of uh, the different. They're different kids, and so. Yeah. Uh, so being in schools was a bit frustrating um, because things changed. The goalposts moved very often. Curricula changed. Um, how you were being judged changed. Politics. Um, and I, <laughs> yeah, yeah lo lots of politics. And, and education's a horrible political football. You know, every time the government changes, 
um, the policy change and what's going on changes. So it's all, it's not always as fun as it really should be. Um, and so, yeah, um, it got, I also had a, a few mental health issues and it got to a point where actually being in a classroom was becoming less and less um, sustainable and healthy for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I took some time out and um, thought, oh, what am I going to do? Because um, like you probably know from your wife, like being a teacher becomes a huge part of your identity. Um, yeah. You know, that you're a teacher and that's <laughs> what everyone knows you as. And that's kind of what you, your self identity is wrapped up in that. So the thought of not being a teacher was actually quite terrifying. Like, oh, I'm not a teacher anymore. Who am I now? <laughs> what am I? So is that um, why you decided to become a head instructor? Because you missed <laughs> teaching or it was just something that just happened? Um, yeah, it was kind of quite deliberate in that sense. Yeah. So there's definitely a sense of um, I got my sort of feet under the table of the actually day-to-day -day development and then okay I kind of see how this is working and I'm doing it and then um but those teaching skills were being exercised how can I um use those skills in some more way so yeah working with eggheads has been great they're an awesome bunch of humans and um yeah I'm learning lots from them I'm teaching in a, in a different way which is great you know I'm, it's been great um Is it the short bits that makes a huge difference from mm. what you are used to? Is it that? Because yeah. usually the classes are up, up to, well, I've seen classes eight minutes, but usually they go around five minutes uh, each yeah. lesson. Yeah. So, you know, I'm my previous teaching experience was managing groups of 30 up to like groups of 100 because I work with adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, managing groups, activities. So a bit of input from me, creating activities for them to try out their skills and then assessing and, and sort of that loop continuing in lots of different ways. Egghead has a very clear mission and clear vision, I think, in terms of it's helping people who are developers move, um, stay on top of new technologies. And it's trying to make sure that every minute that you give is valuable. Um, So if you watch a couple of egghead videos, you'll notice sometimes that, that they cover things in a very short period of time. And when you watch it in 2X, even shorter. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the, there's not the, um, hi and welcome, I'm Kevin. And today we're going to be talking about it. It's right straight in there. And we're talking about what we're doing. And like every second of your time is respected. Um, and you know, I, I think that's a really awesome Um, approach to say I'm not here to tell you about you know my my son scrubbed or fell over on his way to school today <laughs> I'm not here to tell you about that I'm here to, you're here to learn about how do I use context in my app or how do I and I want and you know you might be in the middle of a problem and you're dropping in for this three minute video to hopefully give you a head start so that you can dip back into something else so yeah I think Egghead's been really helpful in me um thinking through the value of those um, um, e-bombs or sort of those educational yeah. like explosions. That makes sense. Also, I'm an egghead learner advocate. Uh, I think I've been for uh, a month and uh, I, I really enjoyed the way how the courses are done. Um, I'm just finishing a adventure club for a course from John that um, it's all about uh, JavaScript callbacks and um, closures. And the course is very dense. So our job is to make notes to try to help folks taking that course uh, to understand better what's happening. And it's mm -hmm. been fascinating to see that in two minutes up to five minutes, how much information is there that every, like you said, every little second is just gold and you can just grab and that's it. So. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's very, very, very cool. And definitely, people should definitely look at, into it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It'd be great. Uh, do you think that your math background helped you when you were doing the coding exercises? Because, you know, if you, I'm not sure if you uh, applied for a job before you're starting uh, spin up, but, you know, usually when you do an interview, you have to get some algorithm questions, some coding challenges. Do you think that that helps you a lot or? 
Yeah, it's interesting. So when I was deciding to make the transition from teaching, um, I did do a remote online boot camp called mm -hmm. Code Institute. Um, they're based out of Dublin. Um, and what I what what the most helpful thing from that was really um, helping me get the 20,000 foot view. Um, so I'm up in your aeroplane now. Um, and um, to kind of, um, because I'd spent so many years learning sort of isolated skills when it came to coding, um, what was really helpful was to get a, a holistic picture and to go, oh, that thing I know fits in here and that fit fits in here. Oh, and that's how they join and that's why that's important. And so um, so that was really helpful. Um, the boot camp was really helpful in terms of giving me a better mental model of um, what I knew and what I didn't yet know, uh, which helped me then be able to develop that. Um, and then when I was looking for a job, um, so I was a, had been a teacher for a while. Um, I was um, quite well paid, I guess. And so I, what I realized was I was going to take a pay dip quite a dramatic pay dip um, in order to make that career transition. Um, and that's what happened. Um, there were there were two companies in Brighton who I was interested in. And the reason I was interested in both of them was looking at their work and um, how they seemed to, the values that I was picking up on their websites. Um, and um, I met with one of them and they were clear, uh, we'd love to have you, but we don't have the capacity to get you up to speed from being junior you know we don't yeah. have you know we need someone who's got more experience that that um typical problem of every job needs five years experience but no one will give yep. you the five years <laughs> experience to be able to play for the job yeah so one of those um but thankfully the other company i applied for was a company called cogap um Co cognitive applications they were originally called and they've been around for a long time like 1980s this company was founded um and they work with um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and they work in being able to help those collections be um, accessible and interesting, um, help people think about how they can innovatively approach their digital properties as much as they do their online, their in-person collections, which with COVID is, I guess, even more relevant. I'm yeah. um, thinking about how your, how your artwork and your um, museum pieces are being represented online and being experienced and explored online. And that was great. Um, I, they, so they took me on um, as a junior, de junior developer and the, the, um, the interview was largely about um, it was an, a person interview and the, the programming or the task of helping to um, like to, to assess my programming skills was definitely on a um, was a more conceptual one. It was like, a, how would you um, go about designing a system where um, an image was being uploaded and being processed and then being served um, on the other end? Um, and I wasn't expected code, but more like blocks of this bit would do that. And I'd probably use this to do that. And it was more, it was less a go and implement this and more a, do you, um, do you uh, have an idea of what you're doing and what questions you would need to ask? The, um, the technical director there um, had something he called the scale of hate, which was, um, uh, developers were somewhere on a scale of hate. They either asked too few questions or asked too many right. questions. <laughs> uh, so, so it was good to ask the right questions, having tried for yourself a few times, a bit, and then and I was there. But they, but they took me on, and I um, wrote PHP, wrote Python, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and and um, that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot with them, um, and they're great people. Um, and I would reckon they're probably still, they probably are hiring. So cogap.co.uk um, are a company I would um, would highly recommend looking at. Um, they, um, and, but after a while, I was kind of aware, I'd come from teaching mm -hmm. and I'd come to work in a business. And I was really, like you're saying um, about, uh, we were talking, I can't remember if we were talking on camera or before camera, um, was um, like having an employer, 
is a single point of failure. Yep. And when you come to kind of um, like, like, like any kind of development, single points of failure are um, always dangerous. Um, and so I was kind of keen to sort of flex my entrepreneurial skills as keen to um, explore sort of doing consulting and client work on my own. Um, and so a friend of mine had started a company called Spin Up and he was looking for some help. And so um, I joined him a year ago and we've been running the company together since then. Um, and yeah, so we work with businesses who've got ideas and we help to get those ideas to be a prototype mm -hmm. first idea that they then bring in front of investors or, or users to test things out to see um, how things are going and whether or not they want to invest more time and money in development after that. Um, so yeah, so that's a roundabout way of question. Oh, your your original question which brought me back there. Sorry, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, you, you asked, um, did my maths help with my coding? Um, I think my maths teaching helped me accept that complex stuff can be explained simply, number one. And um, what I know isn't what... Um, isn't what everyone else knows. So what I've got in my brain isn't what other people have in their brain. So I'm quite good now at like um, not assuming anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm being able hopefully to take complex things and make them as simple as possible. But I think it was um, Feynman who said as simple as possible, but no more, um, not simpler than possible, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's but very, very interesting because you know, it's that uh, the curse of knowledge, because you know something, you can't really put yourself in the feet of someone that doesn't know that subject. So mm -hmm. then for you to be able to make it bite sizes helps a lot on anything, not only mm -hmm. on your um, egghead uh, lessons, but uh, even just approaching a problem. Because a lot of times when you are trying to code something, you just freeze because the problem seems to be very complex. And that's what people say, just say, okay, what is the minimum thing you can grab there mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. start working on that problem and solve little bite sizes problems. So yeah, yeah it, it makes sense that that helped you in your, uh, in your career. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going back to your um, beginning, I think. Mm and working at spin up do you think that uh, that first experience working for a company is extremely important or do you think that if you have a friend that started a company or even a friend that wants to do something with let's say front end or something like that mm -hmm. do you think that it's possible to just have no experience working for a company and starting your own company? Hmm. Um, I obviously haven't done that, um, but what I can, so when I worked with Cog App, I was able to focus on developing mm -hmm. and sort of get confident in delivering to clients. Um, I'm working agile, get confident in all the in processes of um, of working in a team, um, of um, source control, of of all the things in the day to day life of being a developer, um, I was able to focus on that. And then when I when I started with Spin Up, I was then able to be more confident in those skills, so I could kind of go right. I'm going to keep growing in those, but they're kind of at a base level that I'm I'm happy with. Um, and then. I can focus on my in, um, entrepreneurial side of um, acquiring clients, um, working with clients, contracting, negotiating, that kind of th those kinds of things. So, is it possible? Yes, absolutely. Is it playing on hard mode? Probably. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think I, I think there's more um, there are more moving parts, um, and I'm very keen in minimizing risk in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of, um, I, I reckon like working with a, with a company and especially, you know, cog up was a great company, a small company who really valued pers um, staff development and staff welfare and, um, 
the projects they worked on and with and the you know were were really set the bar quite high um which meant that you know i was i wasn't like concerned about lots of things that i might have been um but if i was to, if i had to start it from scratch which was one of the which was one of the things in in mind um i wonder if i would have been pricing too low marketing in the wrong way um like yeah i i i think there's a lot of um there are a lot of things you have to learn as a business owner mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things you have to learn as a developer and if you can um learn one at a time i think you probably have a bit of a head start but i also understand that if you want to um like i i know lots of people who've started businesses and have um, who aren't doing a lot of development themselves anymore. So maybe it's not relevant. Maybe they're gathering clients and, and building a team and and all of those skills. Um, I guess it's what you want to do. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I'm very against the gatekeeping side of things of saying, um, you, I don't think you should do it that way. Um, yeah. I'm really excited that people try stuff in a different way. Um, but yeah. And I think it's also trying to figure out what you're good at and you're strange and just mm -hmm. put that into play and see if it's something that you can use or not. And you'd say that development and building a business are two different things. I also would say that dealing with customers is like a third thing that is a massive thing. And it's sometimes mm -hmm. can be very hard to first figure out what the customer wants. Second, to deliver something that they like and that is functional. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes Absolutely. they're like, oh, I really love, um, I don't know, uh, bright yellow and bright green. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and my app or my website, they need to have these colors. And they were like, oh man, how am I supposed to make that work? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and, and you, the reality is that as a, um, as a, um oop. dev in a company mm -hmm. you are th some of that work's done for you right um so i, I you know the, the acquiring the clients and then the interfacing with the clients and um translating um client desires to actual code or projects um, is handled by a project manager or is handled by a designer and is handled by and, and you're given a design and some sort of acceptance criteria and you build the thing so yeah i think you're absolutely right there is that there's definitely that third thing of of um, interfacing with clients so there's the getting the clients there's the making sure the clients are happy and um interpreting their sometimes off the wall desires and requests into something that's um useful and, and usable i think also that's one of the reasons why so many folks are afraid to get that jump into becoming a freelancer i'm not even mm -hmm. saying build your own company with uh, two other people or another person but just mm -hmm. becoming a freelancer have to deal with customers design everything mm -hmm. and you when we were doing this um, info product challenge, uh, which yeah. you can talk about your um, your product a bit, um, you said, yeah, when we deal with designs, we just hire the designer to do the thing. So then I don't have to worry about that, which mm. that's valid. And sometimes when we are planning to become freelancers, we said, no, I have to do everything. But mm -hmm. is it really worth yeah. it for you to do everything or just outsource something that, you know, you're not great at it and just play your, your strengths? I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's like I'm a developer, and I'm a de I'm not a developer with a good eye for design either. So it's not it's not like I'm a I'm someone who's really good at making things look pretty. I can I'm I'm more I'm more on the back end to middle, and my business partner is more the middle to the front. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely someone who needs a design if I'm I have any hope of making something look nice and decent and all the rest of that um and so yeah i mean we as a as a company we work with a number of freelancers um freelance designers and freelance um ux specialists and and it's that kind of um you know we we don't necessarily we, we don't have the capacity 
for full-time stuff, but we definitely have, you know, there, when we're starting a project and we're thinking about a project, we'll bring in someone to work with us and with a client to be able to, to do that because that's a whole nother professional skill set. And the expectation that I should be a perfect designer and a perfect um, developer and a perfect business owner. And I, 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 I want to, I, you know, I'm a perfectionist and I want to do well at stuff, but I feel like there's a realism that needs to come in somewhere to go. Um, these are stuff that I'm, I, I'm, uh, used, I'm good at and some things I'm not good at. So let's, um, as you said, lean into the stuff I'm good at. I think it's about the whole jack of all trades, master of one, but still better than master of one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, don't try to do things that you know that you're not great, unless you want to do it as a learning experience or something like that. Mm. Um, I think yeah. I could become better at design if I practice every single day, but I always feel yeah. that when I spend more than maybe four hours designing something, in the back of my head, I'm like, I should be coding instead. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you you said that um, when we were talking or when I asked you the question about if having a job first, working for someone as a developer and then starting, you did say that you, you've you learned enough or you felt that you've learned enough that you could do that jump. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a tricky question. So how do you classify knowing enough in development? Because everything is always changing. And I think, mm. especially for a beginner that wants to become a developer, and I felt that, and to be fair, I still feel it. To mm. me, it seems like I never know enough to <laughs> to that jump. Yeah. So it's just something that you do the jump and that's it. Yeah. So I think I, like knowing enough, that's an interesting, so um, I, I've been thinking about, so when you were saying about the jack of all trades, master of none, I was thinking about T-shaped developer. Have you heard that phrase before being T-shaped where you have, um, you're, you've got a broad kind of aware skill set, mm -hmm. but you, in bits of it, it goes deep, like a, like the capital letter T. Okay. So like, it's that kind of T-shaped development thing. Um, and I think as I was aware that that development thing was digging down, um, how did, uh, I was also aware that I could have stayed where I was and my technical skills would have grown. So new stuff would have come along. I would have learned new technologies. I would have got more confident and confident with the technologies I used. I didn't leave CogApp thinking, I know everything. Now I'm going to go and um, you know, do, do it myself. What I learned, left CogApp being able to do um, is be confident with that feeling you have when you first get a problem that says, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. <laughs> I know that in hours or days or sometimes weeks, um, I'll be at the end of that going, oh, that was how I did that. And I'll be able to do something similar again. So I think what I learned was not necessarily all the skills, but I learned the ability to hold loosely to not knowing something to be able to, get, to be able to be more confident in saying, okay, I'm sure that's possible. I don't know how I'm going to do it, um, but I know enough that I know the right questions to ask and the right places to go and the right people to go, uh, could you give, could you run your eyes over this a bit as well? Um, so yeah, so how do you know you know enough? I think when you're confident that you know how to answer your own questions, or where to go to get your answers. When you have that sort of um, ability to to source that, and again, I'm really keen not to gatekeep because I don't think there is enough um, or too little. I think mm -hmm. there's I think there's some some of some people dive into this with less knowledge than I had, and have stellar careers and do amazing stuff. So um, yeah, I never want to say this is my my experience. This is my experience, and therefore everyone should follow it. Yep. Um, but um, I think if you're able to ask to realize you don't know something, and to be confident that you can learn it, like you're saying about the design stuff. Um, if you if you come along across Carol Dweck's work, she um, writes a lot about mindsets, mm -hmm. and in particular growth mindset. And she talks about the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset and how um, people who are good at something 
tend to have fixed mindsets, which means that they don't, so if you tell a kid all the time, you're really good at this, um, then they don't want to prove you wrong. So they avoid doing hard things. Mm -hmm. Where if you tell a kid, uh, you're trying really hard at that and I can see your effort, they're willing to put in any effort to get better at stuff that they're they see not good at. And so when it comes to development, I think that beginner's mind and that growth mindset, that sense of, I don't know this, but I know I can get better at this. Um, and the, the and when it comes to design, I know I do have quite a fixed negative mindset about my design, but I also know that um, I could, I, I'm confident that if I, if I could invest time to improve that skill, but at the moment, as you're saying, for me, that doesn't feel like the best use of my time. And it's not the thing that interests me most. I love learning stuff, but at the moment design is on top of top of um, the things I want to learn. It's on my list. And mm -hmm. I, I think at some point I'll get there is something I want to get better at. And there are lots of great people um, around the web whose stuff I watch and look at and go, wow, I wish I could design. <laughs> so maybe I should go and do something. But at the moment, I feel like I'm trying to get enough skills improving that um, that one's going to have to wait for a bit longer. Which makes sense. And you, it, this was one thing I've noticed on lockdown because I never really had more than two weeks holidays. And we had three months, or at least I had three months staying at home uh, because I can't do flying <laughs> from home. Uh, so mm -hmm. the first month I was really focused and I said, this is the things I want to develop this is the things i want to learn and this is the things that i want to build and then the mm -hmm. other two months i was just being busy but all these activities that uh, all these tasks that i was working i didn't really get much value out of them so i mm -hmm. was doing oh today i'm going to write uh, about something and then oh i'm going to design something and i'm going to design something and it's starting everything but never finishing anything until I realized, wait a minute, this is just being silly. I need to stop and actually focus and see if what I'm working or what I want to work that day, it's actually mm -hmm. good for me. Is that something that I will, will give me value in the future than just being busy for the sake of being busy? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, Eva asked uh, a question. So how long did it take you to go from teaching math to being a developer? And uh, how long from studying to getting your first job? Yeah, so thank you. Um, I, I guess that I feel quite ridiculously fortunate in most of that. Um, so I was teaching maths and um, was helping to run a school. And then, as, as I said earlier, um, I had some mental health issues and being in a classroom just became less and less possible. Um, and I had been coding kind of all the way through. So from when I was 11, doing bits and pieces, but nothing serious and nothing. Ooh, I used stuff in the classroom and did a bit of teaching for it and with it, um, but nothing I was actually getting, exchanging time for money. I wasn't being paid to code. Um, and then I did a online boot camp called um, Code Institute. Um, and that was, and, it, and that was, and it, I looked at free code camp because it was around at that time and I, I, I chose not to do that. Um, I can't remember why. I think it was that I felt like if I was paying for something, I would be held more accountable in my own mind. I'd hold myself more accountable. It seems like a silly way to do things, but I think that's true of a lot of people. There's something like, oh, I've paid for this, so I should do it, um, as opposed to I signed up for this and there's something shiny over there. I'm going to go look at that thing now. I think I read um, some, somewhere that actually the fact that you paid for something actually makes you want to do the thing. If it's free, people tend to just not keep on going and finish off. So I think you have absolutely right there. Yeah, so I did that. And I, I um, actually started the bootcamp in September. And I had my first job as a developer in starting in the January. So um, it's quite fast, yeah. I, yeah, so I was really fortunate. Um, it, was, it was really lucky. They were looking for someone. They had space for a junior. They were local. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was very fortunate. I'm very aware of that. So yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't have to do any of the big whiteboarding stuff and things. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, I feel like I, I played that bit on easy mode. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Sometimes you just need things to align properly and that's it. And it seems to, mm. to me that in your case, it did align properly. Although, like you said, you did have to take that pay cut, which to a lot of people, that can be already something that people are not really want to do. Yeah, um, yeah. We we took a as a family, we took a fifty percent pay cut, which is um, a lot. Which, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so yeah, it was um, and you know that was you know um, we're probably back where we were before I left teaching now, which is great, um, and that was you know it took it took a number of years, mm -hmm. um, but that was almost the continued investment in my developer education was to to kind of um, that pay cut, I guess. Um, so other than the money, uh, was there anything else that was hard doing that transition from teaching to development? People would ask me, um, what, oh, you must really miss teaching. Um, and I would, I would get quiet for a minute because I would think I should really miss teaching. And I think, oh, no, <laughs> not really, actually. Um, what, um, so I, I, I realized after moving out of teaching how much of an introvert I am mm -hmm. um, and how much I was kind of forcing myself to be extroverted, to be in a classroom. Um, so I realized that. Um, and so I, I was able to adjust things. I, my mental health improved, my physical health improved. Um, I had more time at home with my kids, even though I had less holiday. Um, when I got the holiday, I needed it less because I wasn't as exhausted and run yeah. down and I wasn't as um, sort of I, in teaching, like I imagine in flight crew, you run on adrenaline a lot. You just have to keep going and keep going and keep going. There's kind of, there's no let up. Um, and so when it gets to a break, you kind of crash, you know, like, oh, I needed that break so much. Um, and so that would be, so at the start of my career, like it would take me a couple of days in a teaching holiday to recover and that would get longer and longer. Um, it would take sort of weeks and weeks. Um, but yeah, we would, as a family, we would know that the first week of any holiday, we wouldn't plan anything because I would be mm -hmm. in bed sleeping or yep. really grumpy <laughs> by the end of that, <laughs> by the end of that first week, then we could do stuff together in our end. I have yeah. to, to say, I'm sort of in the same shoes as you because the thing I've been realizing is that I'm an introvert as well, which is very weird because at work, I don't think that true unless I do these very long days where I'd like 12 hours days. And after working a week, that first day I'm completely exhausted and I don't want to do anything because it's just, you, you know exactly how it is being a teacher. Um, it's, you don't realize how much it takes out of you being in with people <laughs> every single time mm -hmm. so the only difference is in your case teaching is not only physically tiring but very mentally tiring whilst mm -hmm. in my case i barely use my brain <laughs> this is right. this is a fact it's very physical challenging because the shift work and sometimes i have to wake up at two in the morning other times at five in the morning doesn't matter mm -hmm. but yeah my body is tiring is tired and I feel drained, but my brain is like, all right, I can do stuff. Let's do stuff. And that was, yeah. at least in my case, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to learn how to code because I always wanted, I had that passion to learn how to code and do stuff with code. And I felt that uh, I need to do something to make my brain not dumb, if that makes sense, because it was something like, I tended to stay at home on my days off and I was recharging like you were recharging as well, but mm -hmm. I would maybe read a book or play PlayStation. Uh, I did mm -hmm. spend a lot of time playing PlayStation <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is not the best time or the best way to use my time. So I need to do something that actually challenges my brain and makes me think through. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. So you do a very interesting thing, which I found out today uh, oh. when I was doing a little bit of um, research. Uh, oh, you no. do, you set up your Calendly. I think that's how you say it, Calendly. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. um, and you do one hour pair programming with people that's interested. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea. And uh, I 
I want to book a slot as well <laughs> because uh, it seems really cool. Uh, can you just say how how was that? Why did you decide to start doing that? Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess so. Obviously, uh, we talked about like I had this teaching experience, and um, I really love teaching. Um, and um, one of the things that um, I have trouble with sometimes when I think about egghead and content creation is um, so there's kind of two there's two, kind of two threads of it. So there's the content creation stuff. Um, I sometimes for not sure what to do. Mm -hmm. And so actually those um, those mentoring sessions or those pair of coding sessions, um, often I leave with a list of videos then to go and create um, a list of blog posts to write based on the conversations I've had with, with someone as we've tried to solve a problem. Um, and um, Eva's being mean. Um, and, um, <laughs> I'm going to ask about closure. <laughs> I'm curious now. <laughs> um, and the other side is that, um, yeah, I... I'm one of the, I love teaching, I love chatting and when, and I love sort of working together on a problem. And my colleague and I do that a lot. Um, my business partner and I will, will often pair, pair code something, but also um, I'm not working with juniors or I'm not working mm -hmm. with other, a, a wider pool of programmers anymore. And so I really enjoy getting another perspective on code um, and sort of having my perceptions challenged um, to be able to, to do that. So yeah, um, I have done it a few times. Um, I've worked with four people who've signed up and, and we've had hour long sessions. Um, and yeah, um, I'm really happy to, um, I, I put out sort of individual one shot links um, for, um, for people to sign up and add a, um, add, add a calendar event. And often it's it's I so it's a problem they're working on and just want to as some people call it rubber ducking, mm -hmm. but my last company called it cardboard Superman. So being cardboard <laughs> Superman, so like being a superhero but just being made of cardboard, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, just doing that or or like trying to tackle a problem together or learn something new together. I just love love that process. Um, so yeah, so yeah, if, if anyone watching or listening wants to jump on, I normally tweet out about it a few times uh, a month. So yeah, grab a slot and we'll come come and. Um, Since and you talk that. about that, and this is something I, I'm starting to ask the guests at the end. But if people want to get in contact with you, what is mm -hmm. the best place and where to do it? <laughs> yep. So I'm on Twitter at do learning. And um, my website is kevincunningham.co.uk and you can sign up for my newsletter there. Um, but yeah, so I do a weekly newsletter. Um, I tweet and I do, I try to blog about the stuff and videos I'm recording on Egghead. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's other bits and pieces, but yeah. I will also put the, the link on the description of the episode when, um, cool. when, it, uh, when it becomes a, an episode on on the podcast um so closure what's the story there <laughs> <laughs> so um so eva and i were in a book group um where we read a book called um seven languages in seven weeks or six languages in six weeks some number of languages and some number of weeks if i remember um, correct i think it was seven yeah seven yeah okay cool and eva's just confirmed that yeah. um and um we looked at it was great so we spent a week we went away read the chapter we learned about the language and we came back and we chatted about it and one of the things that we, and, and all the languages were really fascinating um i hadn't coded in any of them really and none of them professionally mm -hmm. and ruby was the only one i'd encountered in any sort of way before um so all the language is really interesting, but one of the things that Prince and Ava really pushed us towards thinking about, um, Prince um, from Party Corgis, um, um, he, Maxell, Maxell on Twitter, Maxell, is that right? Yeah. Maxell on Twitter. Um, one of the things that Ava and Prince both um, were, on the first week, I think, or second week, um, really targeted us on was thinking about the community that was around each language. Sorry. And thinking about, that's okay. And thinking about like the how much support there was for a particular language, what was the feeling you got by sort of dipping into the community of learning that was um, 
that was around that particular programming language. And some of them were great and some of them were less great. Some of them, this book was about 10 years old or is mm -hmm. about 10 years old. And so some of those communities, some of those languages have kind of come to their end and there wasn't much around. Um, but Closure was a community that, um, that was near the end. It was the second to last chapter. Um, and it was near the end. And it was a community I felt like oh, I was really in, interested in and excited by. And um, while we were doing it, I, found, I came across a thing called Closure Fam, um, which is a sort of a, a, a learning group like um, Egghead Adventure Clubs, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a commitment over 35 days to do something in closure. And by the end of it, it's um it's sponsored or it's set up by Athens Research, which would, which have you if you've heard of is like a, a open source version of Room Research, which is like a public note thing going on. Eva's dropped a link in the chat for a closure fam, and okay, thank um, you, the Eva. idea is that by by the end of um by the end of the sev the thirty five days or the seven weeks, you will have made a um a pull request mm -hmm. to the Athens code base which is written in Clojure. Um, so you're learning Clojure in, in cohorts, much like um, if you're familiar with Ken C. Dodds, he's doing cohorts and things like that. Um, and, um, the, and, and so having that team working alongside, learning in public, like, um, like Swix talks about, uh, lots of that learning in public stuff. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy working in Clojure. I got to day 30. I haven't had a PR accepted yet. Um, but um, I got distracted by other shiny things. I'm, <laughs> it's I'm the, the bane of uh, any developer existence. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, um, but I, I'm really, I, I'm, I do have it in my head that one of our team who um, you might know from Egghead, Ian Jones, um, mm -hmm. he, um, he's a developer at Egghead and um, he's had a PR requ request accepted and merged into um, the Athens code base. So he's um, got the head start on that one, but I'm keen. Um, I'm keen to do it as well. Did you share the tweet, or did you tweet something about it? Because I remember mm. reading something about the Athens research. So I'm not sure if it was you that shared something. Yeah. About so it. I was like, I was tweeting each of the days in yeah. each of the learning days. Um, so with the Twitter thread, um, and a few others were doing that. Um, uh, JS Joe Io, um, Joe was doing it as yeah. well. Um, yeah, so there's kind of there are, there are there are four of us from Egghead in this cohort of six or seven. So we mm -hmm. kind of um we kind of overwhelmed them with our Egghead um, excitement. <laughs> so we got a question, but we you already sort of explained your mm. your journey. Uh, so the question yeah. is, uh, how do you deal with the experience requirement for a full stack developer? Um, yeah. Most postings require up, upwards to five years, um, yeah. but you already said that. You Luck. were quite lucky that um, they didn't yeah. really ask you five years experience. And you also found a junior position, which tends to be hard to, to find mm -hmm. nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. have anything else to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, I guess the the uh, companies who are, commit, who, who are able to recognize um, the your capacity to learn and grow uh, is kind of a is a, a thing to look for if you're trying to find a role in that kind of sense. Um, I think what, what I find the the if looking at uh, Sir Peanuts talks about the five years of experience, and if you look at any post, even junior posts, they tend to list every possible technology you could possibly yeah. <laughs> think of, and that feels somewhat overwhelming. And I think there's a disconnect between what people are posting the jobs or are thinking and what people who are reading the jobs are thinking because i think uh, people who are th who are posting the jobs often don't expect you to know all those things but will expect you to know some of those things um and have the capacity to learn the things you don't know in situ as quickly as possible yep. and i think there's that like having that ability to um having that ability to um say Bye, Eva. Um, sorry, <laughs> got a bit distracted. Um, having, have, like, demonstrating what you do know, and demonstrating your ability to get up to speed as quickly as possible, and to learn. Um, and and I think the reality is that being a developer is about constantly learning, because knowing PHP now 
does not mean you're going to know PHP in six months or a year as they move yeah. to PHP 8 and things start to look a bit more like Java or you know, knowing JavaScript. Um, you know, if you were to, you know, if I said I knew JavaScript um, and just used VARs all, all around the place, um, that would get picked up in code review and that people would ask questions about that. Um, you know, why am I not using constant let? Why am I not um, you know, using mo um, list comprehensions, maps, filters, and reduces? Why am I not using the stuff that's in the language now? Um, and so if I five years ago said, I know JavaScript and switched off, or I know a particular program language and switched off, the reality is that list of things is what is not real because it cha that changes. You can't expect everyone to know, be up to date on everything all the time. Yeah. You can expect you can expect a base in some things and a capacity and a willingness and a desire to learn and to move forward in the other things. And it's what you said is also knowing that you don't know something, but knowing how to get the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. I ever mentioned that on her episode where when she was starting, they say, read the documentation. But as a, a new person starting reading the documentation, you can get very lost very quickly. Mm -hmm. After yep. you have that experience, you can find things easier. You can go into the documentation and because you probably read a few bit of documentation yourself, you already know how to navigate documentation, which that's a skill in itself. And sometimes mm -hmm. Documentation is so badly written or organized that yeah, it it takes another effort to try to figure out. Uh, did you have to deal with any imposter syndrome whilst doing the change? <laughs> um, I think I was really clear and upfront that this is all new. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I, I I was kind of let off a bit there. Um, I've dropped a link for a book into the um, into chat. It's called um, Apprenticeship Patterns, um, which I found super helpful. Um, and it's a pattern language for learning. And it makes the point that just reading documentation isn't, isn't great. But, but things like um, they, they talk about breakable toys. Like what is the thing I could make that reflects this? Like, you were talk like we were talking about earlier, what's the smallest possible problem? But if I'm learning this code base, what's an adjacent problem that's small that I could solve that would tell me what this code base is actually trying to achieve? Um, or like, and, and they talk about different things that you can do in terms of um, mentoring yourself and looking for mentors or um, working alongside or not how to read documentation in a way that's useful, like, like you know, and those different bits and pieces. Um, so in terms of imposter syndrome, um, I think I, I think I, all, I I feel that just all the time in general of reality, you know, it's like, oh, but often it's of a, of a kind of you don't you don't really know who I am. You think I'm this person, but that's not really who I am type thing. Yeah. It's often that kind of thing. Um, but I think, um, yeah, that's just a, a, a reality. I'm a very privileged white cis male. Um, and and that means I get to step into situations and um and that and and I'm a native English speaker, and I've got I I I've got a lot of privilege. That means that um that I that I people assume the best often, yeah. Um, and so I recognise that I have a bit of an advantage. I have a huge advantage there, um, that I don't take lightly. Um, so, so yeah. So in terms of imposter syndrome, I guess I've always been okay with not knowing the answer to stuff. Um and not feeling like I'm a useless human being as a result of that, um, but being confident that I can find the answer and be able to um, give me enough time and enough resources, and I'll be able to hopefully learn that thing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. I'm not sure if my chat is delayed or something, but I haven't received uh, the link. Oh. So if you could do it again, that would be great, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I got two questions to finish off because we said that we'll keep under one hour. <laughs> um, what is, what does your day usually look like? Mm -hmm. um... Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> thank, so so um, I am in my shed at the moment. Um, so um, uh, the um, friend of mine, Taylor from Egghead, um, called it my shed quarters, which I'm stealing. <laughs> so I'm currently in my shed quarters, um, and I I work a four day week. Um, so I work Monday through Friday. Um, and um, I, uh, I have two small boys, 
who are normally awake by about 6.30. So I get up at 5.30 and um, read, um, do some exercise, do some stuff um, and um, do some writing. And then um, the boys then tend to get up um, and then I um, will hang out with them and I'll come to my shed quarters at about 8 a.m. And I'll tend to be here from 8 till 4.30 or 5. Um, and I will take uh, during lunchtime, I'll have a 15 minute nap and a, mm -hmm. a, uh, it's, power naps are amazing. And yep. I couldn't have those in the classroom, <laughs> but I highly recommend working from home and having power naps is absolutely great. And I was doing that pre-COVID. So, you know, that, that has, that's great. And during the day, um, so generally we have five or six clients ongoing. Um, I'll generally have a block of a half day or a full day working on an individual client project. Um, I might have meetings with clients to talk about um, what's happened, what's coming up, to deliver, to, to think about what's next. Um, we have our company stand up. There's three of us at the moment mm -hmm. um, on, on, um, on Slack. And I'll tend to have Slack open all day. Um, I'll tend to jump in to help where um, any of my colleagues are stuck or if I'm stuck, I'll ask for help. We'll jump on a call. Um, and yeah, so it's generally um, quite heavily code. So that's, that's good for me. I tend to, you know, most of my day is writing code. Um, some, and some, the rest of the day is either helping others write code or working alongside clients to be able to, um, to be able to get that, to get, get their specifications and, and understand, understand that. And some of it's new business. So talking mm -hmm. to people who might someday be a client. Um, so, so that kind of stuff as well. Okay. And sometimes I get interviewed on podcasts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you have any, well, I just thought about another question. So I try to be quick. Um, yeah, do you have uh, any way to manage your tasks? Do you like a trailer board, uh, to-do list mm -hmm. or a million yeah, ways? So, so for clients we have, um, so it, we try to not be too dict. We tend to ask them about their systems, mm -hmm. so and we can use those. So I mean, for some clients we we'll use Trello, for some we use Notion, for some we'll um, we'll use um, a, a Productive, which is a time management and time tracking. So so we'll have that. But for me, I'm an Emacs user, so mm -hmm. I start my, I start my day with a to do list and Emacs. Um, I clock on to each task, which then tells me how long I've spent on it and clock off it. Um, and I work through, I tend to, in, in, by the, in the end of the day, I'll add any tasks I want to make sure I hit the next day. And I do that for my, and that's how I keep on, trop, on top of um, all my other things as well. Um, Emac Doom, yes, Naren. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I, um, so I, 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 that's how I keep on top of my egghead calendar, my content stuff and um, working on project or products for uh, outside of um, spin up as well. Awesome. And to finish us off, if you were looking at um, yourself when you were 16, now what piece of advice would you give yourself? <laughs> oh, man. So another, another part of my story is that when I was 16, I was planning on being a Catholic priest okay. um, and I spent, I spent two years from 18 to 20 in seminary and mm -hmm. um, training to be a Catholic priest. So um, I would probably invite myself not to do that. Um, so that would probably be my first thing I'd suggest. Um, but I guess um, like, like you're saying about your three months where the first month you planned something and then the next two months you kind of just did fun things and then you saw anything over there. I think I'd encourage myself to spend more time on finishing stuff off, to get better at finishing stuff off earlier. So mm -hmm. it's taken me longer to learn that skill set. Um, Sir Peanuts has just asked how I would approach about pro portfolio projects for employers. Um, and just answered that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, if you don't follow Colber, Colby Foyuk on um, Twitter um, and on Free Code Camp and all around the place, you should. Um, but Colby has just um, a couple of months ago put out a free ebook called um, 50 Projects. Um, for 50 projects for React developers or um, front-end developer type thing. And in there are 50 great ideas that if you had sort of four or five or six of those um, built out um, where you can show the logic and the code and the, yeah, that they'd be, I think that would be make an epic portfolio. Because I think people say go build stuff. 
and That's... then that's a full stop at the end of that sentence. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think I think Colby's project of um, the 50reactprojects.com um, is, an is an amazing tool. So I'm pointing everyone towards that, um, which is great. I, yeah, and there's a link. I got the book. I haven't looked at it properly yet, but I would definitely recommend that as well. Um, mm. So we managed to do it under one hour or one hour. So... Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for taking the time of the day to stop and have a talk with me, uh, us. It's a pleasure. <laughs> um, Thanks for having me. I have so many other things that I would like to ask you, so maybe in the future we need to come back to it if you're all right and do more questions. Even the whole wanted to be a priest, there's a, a lot of... Um, <laughs> A lot of interesting things that we can talk to, mostly because I work with someone, a friend of mine, he followed the same thing, the same path, and then he decided that he wanted to change. So, you know, but that's not mm -hmm. really tech related. Um, yeah. <laughs> so but can you see any of my, so I've, I can see any of my chat messages in the stream? I can't, because... no. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll, that's weird. I've, I, I don't know why. I must be blocked for some reason. But um, Naren's after my name party, Corgi, and I am. No, I think um, Twitch might have blocked me because I'm mean. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, I will. You can send me on Discord, and then we can. Um, I'll cool. put it on the uh, the notes below. Okay. And yeah. Thank you so much, and I hope you have uh, a good uh, Thursday. Thanks. Thanks, Fabio. Thanks, everyone else. Talk to you soon. See you. Bye.